I'm clear we started this podcast on the right note with desperately searching for group chat jingles. Hey, thank you for joining the Escape With Me book club. Escape with me, Sam Reiner. And me, Hannah Rossell. Into our most recent read. Come with us as we evade reality and go into detail about a new book. We'll be covering this book from beginning to end, so there will be spoilers. Today we are going to small town, sorry, small village, England. <laughs> Gotta get the colloquialisms in here. Published November 1969. Gosh, they just missed it. Unless they were trying to be like, oh, the Halloween party just happened. Anyway, Halloween party, I'm gonna assume that's pronounced the same way, is soon to be adapted into a film called A Haunting in Venice. As we've done with the first two movies, let's check out this book and whether it's ready for its big movie debut or if this is another miss pick for the current pro iteration. Okay, so normally we still stop here and then I give historical context and I'm really in depth and good at it and <laughs> we're just going to assume all of those facts that I just said are good but normally I have a good amount where I talk about the books and what's been happening in their personal life so the issue here is this is a huge skip we just did the third Perot book and now we're skipping to the third from the end that is a lot of time for me to research. So we're just going to do a general. And once we get back up here to episode 5082, we will get more in depth of it. But suffice to say, she's had a long and successful career up to this point. And this book came out when she was 79. <sighs> Goodness. I hope I have the conscious ability to still do something really talented. Although this book is arguably different than before. Yeah. But going into this, never read this book before. I know you've never read this book before. Yeah. Actually, I went to a thrift bookstore and they had a collection of like four in the cover that I really like that they're replacing now. They're doing another iteration. I'm like, dang it, I like the one just before. And so I bought all four of those and it worked out that I just so happened to buy this one. Oh, that's useful. I just had the Audible one, so I don't even know what the cover looked like. Okay, the one I had, it's kind of black and orange and there's a pumpkin on it. That's the same one that's on the Audible one. Yeah, I've noticed a lot of her Audible books are the same cover. And it's probably because, you know, nowadays they have two different marketing strategies with cover versus audiobook, but these are old books. And so they just like, here you go. Yeah. I don't really see a need for them to make another one. So it, it kind of just works out. Yeah, I do have to say the narrator for this audiobook, I don't even know his name. It's phenomenal. I thoroughly enjoyed him. So age level, adult, content warning. Ugh. <laughs> just ugh. That's all you need to know. Um, murder, death of a child. Well, murder of a child. Twice. Spoilers. Ableism, victim blaming, and racism toward Romani people. They use the G slur. And then they perpetuated the stereotypes that Romani people steal children. Not true. To judge a book by its cover, now that I've told you what it looks like and you seem to have the same one, I expected it to be spookier. Yeah, and not to bring the movie trailer into it. Oh, did you watch it? No! No, I haven't watched the full thing. Okay, good, because I don't want you to. There's two now that we're going to watch after we talk about the book. Yeah, I saw a very short clip of it. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to watch that. And it's also called The Haunting of Venice. So going into it a little bit to add Judge a Book by its cover, I thought it was going to be spookier. She is capable of really scary books. And then there was none. It's really spooky and really fun. Now that I'm an adult, <laughs> not an impressionable child that has nightmare issues. But I still love it. So she's capable of spooky. And so I was expecting spooky from the cover and the title. And then Haunting in Venice, I was expecting haunting and I was expecting Venice all of these things are not in this book none of it I was really expecting it to be more about you know Halloween yeah it's called Halloween party because a murder happens at a Halloween party the Halloween party wasn't even that spooky yeah like, it actually sounded like fun for the whole family why don't we do that this was great this is actually a fun amount of activities Snapdragon sounded sure. quite interesting. Yeah, I want to know how that works. So you get into this book, and yeah, we're talking about the Halloween party, but can we just get this out of the way? Agatha, I get it. Mental instability and no one looking after children anymore. If anyone wants to be like, oh, it was better in my day, I'm giving them this book to be like, look, remember when they were like, oh, we don't look after our children properly. Yeah, it was definitely a lot of a like back in my day. And I was like, things truly have not changed, have they? 
No. And there are so many repeat conversations that they have. Because at first couple of times, I was like, well, maybe she's making a point. Being like, oh, people are so scared of the mentally unstable. And actually, it was somebody else, which actually this guy was uh, arguably mentally ill. Yeah. Narcissism. You know. But there's only so many repeat conversations I can have when they're talking about, oh, the mentally ill are just allowed to walk the streets now because of overcrowding and blah 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 and people just don't watch their children how many times it happened at least four four separate conversations of paragraphs of this rant there's no way there is no way you can make me believe that she did not absolutely believe that four times okay so we just really know how you feel about this i guess this book was just a rant about how she hates society (laughs) as a 79 year old woman yeah i was like wow i guess older generation have not changed at all. No, we don't change. People just forget what it was actually like. Yeah. So I'm just going to start handing this book out. But just highlight the paragraphs and be like, there you go. I need you to look at page 59, page 102, page 33. Just going to get numbers. They were so close together, too. We didn't really investigate. Every time they talked to someone, it was just this rant exhausting. Because without those rants, this book is real short. If you just skipped all of those, and read just the substantive parts. It's like, wow. If I fast forwarded through everything on the audiobook, it would have been not six hours long. So I half solved it. Three fourths. I got both of the people that I thought were suspicious, and then I always forget they could be working together. Yeah, I partially, I got one person right, and I thought, well, I got one person right, I was like, oh yeah, they're totally involved. And the other person, I was like, you're suspicious. Okay, let's talk about this. Right at the beginning, well, first let's introduce somebody. Say hello to Ariadne Oliver. Once again, Agatha Christie has her own MCU universe here. Ariadne is one of the other detectives in her universe. So far, I've never seen anything about Miss Marple and Perot meeting, but everybody else meets. I think she's in four books total. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, you see her before. So when they're like, oh yeah, you like apples, that comes up. Mm-hmm. Well, knowing that, Nolan voids my question. I'm still going to ask it though, but I didn't realize Oliver had her own detective book series, but I'm still asking. Yeah, she's in a, oh, she's in a bunch of them. That looks like more than four. Let me double check. I want to be the most accurate I can be. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then in an, one of the novellas. I mean, that is at least four. True. And there's even an in joke possibly about, and then there was none that I did not get before where somebody mistakes someone named Mrs. Owen for Mrs. Oliver. Perhaps this is an in joke that Emily Brent and Ariadne Oliver may have encountered each other at one point. Oh. I did not get that. That went right over my head. That's for sure. Yeah. She's first introduced in Cards on the Table, which we're going to read pretty soon. She was first appeared apparently in a brief appearance in a short story, The Case of the Discontented Soldier, in the August 1932 issue of the U.S. version of Cosmopolitan Magazine, under the subheader of Are You Happy? If Not, Consult Mr. Parker Payne. The story first appeared in the U.K. in an issue of Women's Pictorial, and this was later published in book form as Parker Payne Investigates, Mr. Parker Payne Detective in the USA. Mm, interesting. So that was her first appearance. She appears briefly in a bunch of other things, but she's mainly in Perot novels. Okay. There you go. The busy lady. So she is well known to supposedly readers if you read them in order. The audiobook narrator gave her a very annoying voice. <laughs> she seems to be a very annoying character, so. We got rid of Hastings and now we have Ariadne. Well, even Perot is like, oh, it's you, my friend. We can't escape them. So now we have the anti-Hastings fan club, or you have to start like the anti-Ariadne fan club? It's not worth it. Like, she's not fun to hate. She's just annoying. Dislike for Hastings runs deeper than Miss Oliver. Well, plus there's fun banter with Perot, like him being stupid, and it's like, oh, the one time I thought you were good at stuff. I never thought Ariadne was good at things. 
sense. But yeah, no, she as one of the main characters is absolutely the level for this book. Yeah. But back to my previous point. Ranting about characters, it's fine. I knew we're straight up spoilers if you're thinking we're going to go in any sort of reasonable order. Technically, this is the beginning, but we're also going to be talking about the end. But I knew from the moment the host Rowena Drake, I knew as soon as she said, let's do bobbing for apples inside in the library with the thick carpet that she was suspicious I was like excuse me why is this being done inside the house and not outside like a normal place they were very specific about oh well that container would tip over too easy I didn't know bobbing for apples was that intense that containers tipped over Rowena suspicious I was immediately like why is this inside and then she got murdered and I was like okay this is weird what finally tipped it off for me I was like that's a little weird in retrospect but it was talking about the will and the forgery I was like oh Rowena is suspicious when they're like, oh, her husband was hit by a car. And I was like, oh, it's a really convenient thing to arrange and say it was a tragic accident, Rowena. Yeah. No, I immediately was like, this is weird. Yeah. I think this is the first time I've listened to or read a pro book where I was like, oh, it's this person. A hundred percent. And I was right. I was like, oh, I'm proud of myself. <laughs> it's because it was obvious. Yeah. You can't tell me she's not a part of it. She came out of that room. No, she didn't come out of the room. Somebody else came out. Though. One of the kids came out of the room. But it was just, there's so many things about her that was super suspicious. What was it? Right before Snapdragon happened, they're like, no one knows when it happened. Literally in the book, there was a scream. And I was like, no one knows when it happened, though. None. Scream. Nope. Anyway, they're getting ready for this party and a bunch of people are here. Although I will note, I think it was a couple of different people that I think were just mentioned at the getting ready. But as soon as they were like, hey, these are all the people they're getting ready. They weren't listed. So I don't know. Like Nan was mentioned as one of the girls, but she she didn't get called out unless Kathy, Diana, or Anne could also be Nan, but I don't know. I don't know. And it seemed also that Miss Oliver was the one relaying that information. So it seemed like, oh, well, maybe she forgot because she also didn't know who all these people were. So I was like, well, maybe she's just unreliable source, <laughs> which I mean, yeah. Yeah, but it was okay. That's weird. We're not going to assume it's a bunch of these people. Here's an example. Emmeline. She doesn't mention. I was like, that's weird. By the way, there is officially a word for the type of glass that just sit on the bridge of your nose and they don't have the arms. What are they called? Pince nez. Because that is in the book. Oh. <laughs> it's like, she wears pince nez. And it was like, huh, what does that mean? And those are the glasses that go on the bridge of your nose. Oh. Think of like a monocle, but two. Yeah, they're really interesting. So, that word. <laughs> and they usually have some sort of chain that connects to somewhere. So if they fall, they don't fall off. But fun fact. That was the fun fact I got from this book. <laughs> also, the Halloween party sounded fun. But anyway, they're getting ready for this party. Mm -hmm. And one of the girls is like, oh, I totally know about a murder. And they're like, okay, that's a weird thing to say. And they're like, whatever. Everyone thought she was lying, which funnily enough, she is. But by the end of the party, which was very shocking a little bit, the 13 year old was dead. Dun, dun, dun. I was, I did not have Agatha Christie murdering a 13 year old on my bingo card. So Ariadne gets Perot involved because, of course. Of course she gets involved. Why wouldn't she? So he starts talking to people. <laughs> At one point, Perot does the thing where he's like, I could totally see someone murdering Mrs. Drake. And I was like, uh-oh, that's a bad sign. Death on the Nile has taught me he's too good at this. <laughs> but no, she was not the next body. He starts talking to the people at the party and Mrs. Drake is mad. Ugh, and it almost ruined the party or something like that. How rude of her. Way to have priorities, Rowena. My party got ruined. Can you imagine that mother's life? Which, can we talk about Joyce's siblings? That mom is raising three sociopaths. Maybe not Joyce. We didn't get to know her that long. But you meet the other two siblings and one of them is older and it's the day after their sister got murdered. The older one's studying and she's acting like this is a big inquisition. She's like, Joyce just lies. And she gives examples of how she's a liar. Even though the mom was like, oh, she never lied. And Nan's like, no, she totally did. She said, that she went to India with her uncle and blah, 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 blah. And how she used to basically borrow stories. And then goes back to studying because, you know, your little sister got murdered yesterday and that's the priorities here. So they go to the brother. I did not like him. Who is, how old is this child? And 16. I want to say he was 10 or 11. Joyce was 13 and 10. 10. Leopold is 10 
years old and he is in the backyard playing with rockets and they try to ask about stuff and he's just like ugh stop bothering me with this they're not only totally fine but they're like I don't even care that that happened to her and even if they were like oh she was a terrible sibling not even a moment of wow someone younger slash a little older than me was murdered that's weird life is so unpredictable you know it's like it was just a big inconvenience okay Like, they hated her. Yeah. No survivor's guilt. No, it could have been me. No worry, scare, or anything. And yet, they're like, no one would do it. A little part of me right there was like, they did it. Siblings know something. They're involved. They are so true of Because you come to find out the 10-year-old did know who murdered her and was blackmailing the murderer. So he himself gets murdered. This is a 10-year-old. I'm not going to blame the mom. She seems like a nice lady, but he's 10. And blackmailing murderers instead of telling people who murdered his sister. He's going to make the money and then snitch. Dumb. Dumb. And scary, honestly. Yeah. Anyway, everyone's like, Joyce is the boy who called Wolf. Yeah. Which immediately made me think of Star Trek, where the point was, boy who called Wolf actually teaches you not to tell the same lie twice. Mm-hmm. They came for the first one, they came the second time, but after you lie twice. Uh-uh. She didn't tell the same lie. She seemed like she was quite creative. Yeah, sorry, it's a joke. <laughs> yeah, I know. I thought it was an unfair comparison. She didn't cry wolf. She tells tales. So there's this random lady, Llewellyn Smith, with a Y, because of course. That's how they spelled it? Oh. Yeah. L-L-W-E-L-L-Y-N dash S-M-Y-T-H. Okay. I copy and pasted that name in my notes. I was like, I'm not writing this every single time. But she's very rich and is related to the Drakes. And I have questions because it's like, oh, she's the aunt of both Mr. and Mrs. Drake. And I'm like, okay, so who's the relative? They just dropped the bomb that they were first cousins? Yeah, the answer is both. They're first cousins. This book came out in 69. Rowena's in her 40s. Maybe I am just lacking in my Alabama history, but... I was like, what? Question, internet, when did it become illegal to make... Marry your first cousin. Holy inbreeding. In England. Oh, never mind. There is no legal barrier to two cousins having a relationship in the UK. And they make fun of America? Let me double check that there's a law in the US before we say anything. In some states, you have to, I think, prove that you're not. The first actual laws against first cousin marriages appeared during the Civil War era, with Kansas banning the practice in 1858, followed by Nevada, North Dakota, South Dakota, Washington, New Hampshire, Iowa, and Wyoming's in the 1860s. It's still not illegal in every state but at least we got something against it what in the world my google history is gonna be very weird (laughs) your fbi agent is like what okay so here we are cousin marriage law in the united states thank you wikipedia several states in the united states prohibit cousin marriage as of february 2014 24 u.s states prohibit marriages between first cousins 19 u.s states allow marriages between first cousins and seven u.s states allow only some marriages between first cousins why is it allowed at all. So we've got all of the South except Mississippi and Louisiana. They put their foot down. Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, California, Alaska, Hawaii, Vermont, New York, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Jersey, Maryland, and D.C. Cannot do it in West Virginia and Kentucky, but everything else. So all those states, plus all the South ones you think of. And then special circumstances is Maine, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Utah, and Arizona. Everywhere else is no. But congratulations to Kansas for being the first one. I want to know what the special circumstances are that make the government be like, yeah, you can marry a family member. That's totally normal. All right, let's pick a random state. Let's go with Arizona. Why are you out here having relations with your cousin? I get like you may not know, but if you know. Oh, in Arizona, first cousins can marry if they are both 65 years or older. What does magically being 65 have to do with it? Well, they can't reproduce because the other condition is if first cousins younger than 65 can marry, they have to prove to the superior court judge that one or both of them is unable to reproduce. All right, let's pick another one. Wisconsin. 
Wisconsin. One exception applies to this rule. First cousins and first cousins once removed can only marry if they are at least 55 or either is permanently sterile. So it seems like based on these two states out of like the six, as long as you can't make kids, who are we to stop you? That's fair. So yeah, and you could totally just marry your first cousin in the UK right now. And a bunch of states. So he just talks to a bunch of people and they all talk in circles and they're all like, oh, she lied. And this lady that we went on the tangent with had this quarry and she was like, you know what sounds good? A garden. And so she hires this one dude who's probably the only dude not from the area and is weird. The higher thinking artist trope, like I'm more intelligent than you because art. What was his name? I think it was Garfield or something. Like his last name was Garfield, right? There's so many characters. Yeah, Michael Garfield. Sorry, I'm scrolling through all the other unsolved murders in this case. Yeah. I thought they were all going to be solved. I thought they were all connected. I thought this spending time talking about these was not a waste of time and more excuse to just complain about people not watching their children and the mentally unstable being among us. Yeah. And really, Laura spent a very long time talking about how beautiful Mr. Garfield was. Like a Greek god statue or something like that. I was like, Poro, are you a little bit jealous? I think he was suspicious. But no, the reason he had to is because we as an audience need to be sold on the fact that he is Zeus reincarnated. Otherwise, the ending plot doesn't make sense. Fair enough. So that's why. The whole tangent where like, the only thing he's proud of is his mustache. And I was like, what a random little tangent in this book of random little tangents. <laughs> Things you would have never known. But I feel like he goes and talks to people and then they're like, no, there's no murder. There's nothing weird. And then he goes and talks to them again or someone else. I feel like he talks to the school teacher twice before she's like, okay, here's actual helpful information information. I guess I'm gonna. Why? I just finished a book. It was actually very good. I want to look up specifically because I don't want to get the title wrong. All Sinners Bleed by S.A. Cosby. It's good? It's a small town southern suspense book and yes, it's good. I thought it was very good. I liked it better than Razorblade Tears, but I'm not a huge fan of revenge books where it's like, you've done this bad thing to me so I will track you down to for my revenge. Not a big fan of like John Wick movies or any of that. It was still very good. It's just not my genre. Yeah, I'll have to put them on TBR. But that one I thought was very good. But that handled the, I'm not talking to the police. I'm not helping with the investigation. No, there's no way any of us could have done it. We're a small town. This is X town. Nothing bad happens here. It handled that so much better. And granted, I don't know how fair it is to rate a book in someone's prime versus 79. But still, if she was gonna keep going, still open to criticisms. So it doesn't feel like, oh, we're a small town. We're not gonna talk to an outsider, especially a foreigner, which they bring up in the first couple of books. So I'm not sure why they didn't bring it up this time. It's mentioned a couple times, but not convincingly. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. It felt like a waste of time instead of fleshing out the psychology of small village Woodley Common. So yeah, it just felt like a waste of time because I feel like in her peak, we are on book three and you're about to read Roger Ackroyd and she does not waste a word. This has a lot of waste. (laughs) But let's get to some of the facts. There is a plot about a child being much younger. It's the girl that gets murdered. And she's like, oh, I saw a murder when I was much younger. And I meant to do this. I know a 12-year-old now. I meant to ask because they said when they were way younger. Uh What does way younger than 12 mean to you? Eight and below. I would have said like six. Half that age, right? I'm going for like if they're 12, eight and below, that's still a good two quarters of their life. Much younger, right? Yeah. Pro gets in his mind that nine is way younger to a 12 year old and I meant to ask a 12 year old but you have to imagine at least to a five year old I don't know many 12 year olds our age is decrepit about to fall apart yeah and it was like if you say as a five year old when I was way younger that could be like three months ago fair but to a 12 year old nine why are we automatically assuming 
nine. Yeah, I was like, how did we come up with that? Because instead of trying to solve her murder, he ends up trying to figure out the murder that she saw. Yeah. Because everyone's kind of blocking him and ranting about the crazy people out here. Sigh. I miss when hints were a throwaway line in a random paragraph. Yeah, it was very obvious this time. Yeah, because they harp on the fact that no one takes her seriously to an annoying degree and that she lies and steals stories to an annoying degree. I get it. And so shock and surprise, she stole someone else's story about seeing a murder. It wasn't spelled out for me at all. And we have this information and we're still talking to people and still talking about child murderers and not enough places in asylums. And I'm just like, Agatha, did you write a novel or did you write a shallow open world RPGs where all of the NPCs say the same thing? It's so frustrating. But anyway... You find out that this girl who lives near the quarries, Miranda, is the one that actually saw a murder when she was younger. And so she doesn't really come out and say it, who did it or what. So thanks, Miranda. Super helpful. Yeah, she's just like, oh, yeah, I saw this thing. That's it. Yeah. So more blah, blah, blah. Children getting into vans with candy, blah, 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 blah. Let's just get to the end because I'm tired. (laughs) Met a lot of people in this book that ended up not being. There's not a lot of people in this book that were useful. Yeah. Or necessary. Why were you here? Bro figures out who it is and tells... Ariadne, go get this random lady who's the mother of Miranda. I think it's her friend, Judith. She's like, hey, you need to go to London right now, like on the road right now. He calls and tells her this and she's like, okay, let's go. And so she goes. Tangent about how it was an actual telegram and not like one over the phone and she's like so shocked. Modern technology, scary. (laughs) Oh goodness gracious. Her brain would have been gone if she had made it to email, but. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, he's talked to Miranda once or twice in the garden. Miranda's like, oh, I want to find the wishing whale, but Michael won't tell me where it is. And Michael's being kind of weird about it, being like, oh. There's no girl. Yeah, there's no girl named Kitty that disappeared. It was a cat. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, there's a whole plot about her wanting to find the wishing well and always being in the garden and liking to watch people while standing very still. Not a little bit disconcerting at all. Yeah. But like you said, she got a telegram. I'm sorry, it was not a phone call. (laughs) I remember because I was listening to that and I was like, okay, so we don't like phone calls. Got it. She's probably tired of people calling her. But (laughs) so she goes over there and she convinces her friend. She's like, okay, we need to go right now. But Miranda's like, but I need to tell my friend goodbye. Immediately she's dead. I was surprised she came back, honestly. Yeah, I was like, oh, I knew she's going to tell the murderer. Absolutely. Because this is her friend. That's why they need to leave and not make it look weird that they're leaving. Yeah. She leaves a note to Kat. Kathy, her friend. And I was like, this is dangerous. You're doing all of the things Perot said don't do. Also, there's no timeline in this book. It's kind of hazy with all the stuff that happens because they mentioned four murderers and Mrs. Drake's husband suspiciously dying and this lady buying the quarry and possibly an island being bought. It's a lot. Anyway, they're traveling to London, Ariadne and the butlers. Mm-hmm. They stop. Ariadne gets a table. Judith, the mother, and Miranda go to the bathroom. And I know right here. The thesis statement that Agatha Christie has been working toward because Judas comes back to the table without Miranda because people don't watch their kids anymore. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, yeah, she's fine. But let's forget about safety real quick. Scratch this out. These are two adults going to the bathroom together. Is it not basic manners to wait? Am I crazy? You go to the bathroom with someone. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't you wait for them to be done and walk back to the table together? Am I crazy? Isn't that the basic bathroom rules? That's the manners, right? That's what I would do. Is this a regional thing? Tell us in the comments below because I am very confused. Even if this wasn't a mother and daughter, that's so rude. Anyway, also at this point, I was like, did Judith do it? She in league with Michael? Anyway, surprised Noah, Miranda's missing. Shocking. 
she's taking a long time. I was like, oh, she's gone. There's a door in the bathroom, apparently, to the outside, which, what? (laughs) That's no, no way. Absolutely no way. You're kidding me. As a business, could you imagine having a door from the bathroom outside? That doesn't seem like smart design choices here. Anyway, there is. So Miranda's gone. And apparently they find a body in the well, to the surprise of no one. Oh, we forgot to mention them. There's these two teenagers that everyone's suspicious of, but Perot's not. And he's like, hey, boys, do the thing for me. And what ends up happening is the killer, which I love... I appreciate how she tried to do it with having the killer speaking and not revealing who it is. But it's so obvious from the way he talks who it is. Yeah. If anyone at all was suspecting that it wasn't Michael, as soon as it gets to, oh, we must do an ancient ritual in which you die, child. You must sacrifice yourself for the good of the gods. I'm just saying. I think she's also 13. So grooming is absolutely a factor here. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. Wow. Yep. But what? And I tried, I can't mentally fathom this, but it has been a long time since I was 13 and I was not groomed as a child. And she apparently is super isolated as well. I think she's invalidic and her only friend is Joyce. Like that's the only person that's nice to her and talks to her regularly. So this is technically the only other person she has contact with beside her mother. Uh-huh. I don't know. Somehow they're close enough that he has convinced her that she needs to sacrifice her life. Yes. For the gods. For beauty. For beauty's sake. But anyway, the boys show up and kill the killer because apparently he had twisted in Miranda's mind that Joyce is dead because of Miranda, which I absolutely can see an adult convincing a confused and lonely, sad child of doing. Yeah, especially when that was your one good friend. Yeah, because she parroted her story. And so it's like, oh, it's your fault. If you never told her that, then she wouldn't have gotten murdered. Yeah, exactly. As a reader, I'm tired. (laughs) This is the mystery solution. And yeah, there's some twist in it. That's kind of fun. And I can see how grooming would totally, but it's very, very dramatic. In a way, her books aren't normally. Even in then, there was none has its dramatic moments but it's dramatic in its understatedness she just kind of lets it stand to be as horrifying as it is but this it was over the top of an ending a little too much drama and i say that probably because this entire book i've been fed up with oh we just have crazy people walking around and people don't watch their children look look how many children were murdered it was just what are we doing here i want to go home so that's how I feel about the ending. It just feels so politically charged. Definitely a disappointment compared to her other writings. Yeah. But another part of me is like, thank goodness something dramatic happened at the end. This book is boring. (laughs) Finally, something happened for like a page. Yeah, that was how it felt listening to it. I was like, oh, thank goodness. But then it just leaves you feeling hollow. Are we going to tell the dear listener what happens and how it was all? Okay, so here's the explanation. (laughs) You sound so excited. It's never stated, but I'm 100% sure Mrs. Drake killed her husband in a hit and run. Oh, yeah. So let's start with that. Definitely did it. So Mrs. Drake is the one who killed Joyce. A little bit, I feel like you can tell because like I said, she's just upset that the party got ruined and not that a child got murdered at her house where she was in charge of a lot of... I'm just... Anyway. She picked the library specifically because it was away from all the activities and she did it during the Snapdragons because the Snapdragon's loud. Yes. Whatever. I knew the library was a weird pick from the beginning. And then she dropped a vase full of water to cover up the fact that she was soaking wet from drowning someone. Yeah, because someone saw her in the hallway and she dropped the vase and then got herself wet because supposedly, oh my gosh, I saw someone almost coming out of the library. If you knew you had that witness, why wouldn't you volunteer that information? Because Mrs. Drake knew this random school teacher came out to help dry her off. It's gonna come up. Yeah. But she didn't. She doesn't volunteer the information until later. That was a mistake on her part, honestly. So Mrs. Drake's aunt had a housekeeper named Olga. 
And she disappeared one day, I think really shortly after the aunt died. After being accused of forgery. Yeah, forging the will. Instead of it going to Miss Drake, which is when I was like, oh, okay, so Miss Drake did it. Yeah. The aunt found out about the affair between Mrs. Drake and Michael. So she got upset and she, mm, I'm so tired of people in Agatha Christie books. Rich people, stop writing two wills 30 minutes apart. Oh my gosh, yes. You're just confused. Using everyone. She hid it in a book. Why? Give it to your lawyer. Make it official. Oh my gosh. So that's why she was very easily called for forgery. Because they're like, oh, Olga can forge her handwriting. But it wasn't because a forgery at all. It wasn't. It was so tiny. Anyway, so Mrs. Drake and Michael are having an affair, but while this is going on, Olga and Michael are also getting together, and Olga wants to marry Michael. And Michael was obviously playing both sides of the fence trying to get this money, but he decides to go team Mrs. Drake when he thinks she's not going to get the money. Mm -hmm. Besides, she wanted to stay in England, and he wanted to buy a Greek island to go live on, so, you know. But, you know, they don't sell islands anymore, but money can make things happen. I uh, Clearly a compatibility issue. No. So tired. Anyway, continuing. This explanation is so long for so little that happened in this book. But yeah, so they killed Olga and they carried her body to the wishing well. And that's when Miranda saw this. And she didn't realize it was murder until later because that's the story. She's like, oh, I saw a murder, but I didn't realize it until I got older. How do you not realize that someone's body getting dumped down a well? Well, she didn't see that. She saw them carrying Olga. That is true. And being suspicious and Mrs. Drake being like, oh, I think I hear someone. And him being like, nah, you didn't hear someone. And then they walked off. And later being like, wait a second. That's true. And then they also killed this guy named Ferrer. Leslie Ferrer, who was stabbed in the back. He was a law clerk at the lawyer's office of the aunt and a known forger, even though... Anyway, I'm not even going to go over him. He's one of the four murders, and so that one was connected. And I thought all four were going to be connected, but then they weren't. And then I was just kind of disappointed. Because that was the only thing at this end that would have made me feel happy, I guess. Satisfied? Not quite. I don't even know. Less disappointed. Yeah, it's a good word for it. So they killed that guy because he was involved with the will crap. And then Mrs. Drake thought they were going to live happily ever after. And Perot's like, ah, very likely as soon as they moved to the Greek island, he was going to get rid of Mrs. Drake. Yeah, so he was just going to be rich on his own. Because he's a sociopath. Was he Miranda's father? Yes. That's the other thing. Judith is a single mother. Widow. Yeah. And Miranda doesn't know who her father is. So this is even creepier. Because I'm pretty sure he knew. Yeah, and there was that whole scene where he's like, oh, just drawing her. You know, you just forget people and you can't recall blah, blah, blah. To mind. I was like, dude, she's like 12. Oh my gosh. Yeah, there were some really creepy vibes. He preyed on the fact that he was attractive and used that to coerce Miranda into doing things he wanted her to do. It was all very sketchy. Yeah. Poor choice of words because he was actually sketching her, but it was very suspicious when he was like, oh yeah, I draw her because I don't want to forget people's faces. I'm like, okay, she getting murdered. Yeah, I was like, this dude's a creep. Eww. Problematic. So yeah, no, not only was this dude preying on a 12-year-old to do what he want and grooming her, it was her own father that Miranda was in love with. Totally normal. The incest vibes of this book. Yeah, I was like, oh, wow. I, uh, so I'm even more mad at Judith's mom, which I'm mad that I'm mad at her because Agatha's right. If you had just watched your children, we would have been in better spot. Ah! No! It, I just can't. I can't. I'm so tired. I'm just so tired. Wait, did the boys kill him or did he drink something to kill himself to get out of trouble? I don't even remember. Anyway, he's died. He died. And it never confirms if Mrs. Drake killed her husband and her aunt. Yeah, I'm willing to bet she probably mowed down her husband in the car. The aunt could have really just been poison. poison or just coincidence and timing, but that ever happens. That's too suspicious for me. But there's not confirmed. Yeah. So on a side note of this, Woodley Common has a large amount of widows per capita. Yeah. So many widows. Yes. Totally normal amount of widows all in this one teeny tiny spot. Yeah. The codicil to the will wasn't a forgery. It was actually witnessed, but then hidden in a book. Yes! People writing the wills and then hiding them. She wrote two of them too! I just, ah! Why? Give it to a lawyer! Is a codicil a whole separate will? Is that another fancy word for a will? How is it spelled? 
Okay, here it is. Codicil. Yeah, cod i c i l. An addition or supplement that explains, modifies, or evokes a will or part of one. Either way, why are we writing very important and binding legal documents? And not telling people that it's in a book! And then hiding them. Give it to a lawyer! Do it in front of a lawyer! Have your lawyer draw it up! Yeah, it cracks me up that she kept describing old ladies' handwriting as spiky. And I was like, that's, that's a pretty accurate description, actually. That made me laugh. I wonder if she had spiky handwriting. Right. But I can't. (laughs) The crux of this book is stop not giving your lawyers wills, rich people. Stop hiding important documents, please. I beg you. This whole book did not have to happen. The equivalent of people stuffing cash under their mattress. Stop it. I get you may have your reasons, but it never ends up well for anybody. General thoughts. Where was her editor? You did not see this nearly as much because of the audiobook. Or maybe you did. Because, first of all, her books have always had issues with either typos or punctuation issues. And I've always wondered why they don't just fix that, but that's beside the point. There were just strange sentences. Like, bringing up someone that has already been brought up. Yeah. Right after each other. Or repeated sentences. Like, I had a sentence, I wrote it somewhere in my notes, and that's a lot of notes. But it was the same sentence Five pages apart. Oh, wow. I just noticed, didn't we just hear the sentence? It was weird. And I feel like a good editor would be like, okay, hey, maybe we should have don't not watch your children like two times spaced out. Maybe say it in a different way instead of the exact same way over and over again. Yeah. That was one where sentences repeated quite a bit. You have strong feelings. Don't keep saying them 10 times in a row. But were they just like, I'm just happy she's still writing and I don't want to piss her off so she doesn't stop writing? Probably. I'm mad at the editor, frankly. They take advantage of this 78-year-old woman who needs to stop. I'm a little worried for curtains now. We'll be back. (laughs) We'll get there. Unless they make another Perot movie, randomly. But really, how are they going to base... I mean, the movie's going to be in a whole different setting. Oh, don't worry. It's time. I'm going to send you two links. Oh, boy. One is going to be the first trailer. Okay. And then they just released a second one that actually has more narrative to it. Okay. So this is the one from two months ago. Watch that and then we'll talk about that one. Okay, so first of all, before we talk about anything in that trailer, I wanted to point out some of the marketing that you may not have seen. Yes, please do. This movie is very proudly boasting that this is the first movie adaptation of this book. Lies! Liar! In that trailer, and maybe you can pick out other things, there is a girl that seems to have been drowned, and then there is an Adam and Eve with the snake in the garden imagery at one point, which comes up in the book that I forgot to mention because who cares? (laughs) Yeah. Besides that, was anything in that trailer recognizable? No, it really just seems like they took the idea of a murder at a party involving a drowned child and ran with it. They're not even at the party. She drowned a year ago. And now they're at a seance. And I'm about to send you the second trailer because it gives more narrative of what the heck happened. I was multitasking while watching and reading the comments. And this comment took me out. When trying to solve an Agatha Christie mystery, simply pick the most convoluted possible solution. I mean, they're not wrong. (laughs) Trailer number two. Trailer number two. How old is Poro? Because I definitely called him senile a few times in the book. And I was like, how old is he? He's really old. I'd have to go back and look, but I know we talked about it with the first book. He gets super old, almost 120. So this is three books from the end. I don't know what year it's supposedly published in, because sometimes it's different than our actual published year. But he's like 100, at least, minimum. In the book? In the book, at this point, yeah. 1969. He was in his 50s, 60s, in 1923. He's in his hundreds. And they follow real time? Yes. It is not an age freeze. He does get older. That gives a little bit more context. Can they really claim that it's an adaptation of the book? Right? So in this one, the girl's name is not even Joyce. 
Oliver. Yes, Tina Fey is Irene Oliver. So that's accurate. Tina Fey gives her a much more witty portrayal than the book. But lies! I understand why they changed the name. They move it to Venice. It's about a seance and Tina Fey being like, hey, we need to prove that the seance isn't real. And then somebody dies. It doesn't reveal who died. But supposedly this little girl that was drowned murders somebody. And he's like, oh, we have to figure out if the dead killed the living and blah, blah, blah. Scary movie, blah, blah, blah. I don't know why it's coming out in September 15th instead of later. It was scary season. Halloween? Yeah. I would have understood if it was like September 25th or something really close to October, but it's really early in September, which is very interesting marketing wise. Also, like, why would you pick this book to base a movie off of? It makes no sense. This book does not need an adaptation. There is a TV show that has an adaptation of it. This is TV show worthy. This isn't movie. It's not worthy. It's not worthy. Which is the crux of it. I don't know why they picked this book because we've said the same thing with Death on the Nile. I don't know why they picked that book, but at least they followed the plot. Yeah, and at least out of the two, Death on the Nile had a little bit more going. It was the same plot. Same people did it. Same basic setup. Even the stuff that they changed, it still resembled the book. Also, for some reason, I don't know why. I'm not as impressed with the mustache. It seemed a little lackluster. And I don't know why. If I go back to Murder on the Orient Express, it's just better. Yeah. Is it done by the same director? Yeah, I want to say it's still enough. Just had a better mustache. I have mixed feelings. So this episode is going to come out September 11th. And this movie comes out the 15th. So this is before we know anything about the movie. Frankly, I know you're worried. I am relieved. <laughs> Please write a completely different story for this book. And I kind of like that they don't even have the book title. It's not Halloween Party. I don't want to see a movie version of this book. I was just thoroughly unimpressed by the Death on the Nile. Granted, that was more because I didn't follow the book at all and still use the same title. So maybe this one will be good. But it did. But it didn't. But it did. But it didn't. It didn't enough to be annoying. Yes, exactly. But I could at least see which book they picked. Yeah, so like this one, I don't view it as an adaptation. At all. So the marketing is BS. But please bring in the jazz singer love interest. Bring in the awkward sexual dancing. Bring in the bad acting. And the bro was actually part of World War II and had a nurse love interest that he loved and then she died and blah, blah, blah. Blink. All of it. Please. Yes. <laughs> Just not this book. <laughs> yes. I will take that over this book. So for once, I was excited for Murder on the Orient Express. I was excited for Death on the Nile. And I was expecting to have delayed flop feelings where I trusted that the second movie was going to be good and then it wasn't. And then I would be like, oh, I don't want to see the third then. But why not? I'm going to go see it. Might as well just watch it. <laughs> why not? Not go to theaters. Wait till it comes out on something. I'm going to wait for it to come out. I'm not paying to see it. No, I don't want to encourage this behavior. <laughs> so yeah, that's the book they picked. And that's how they're going with it. My husband's like, I just want to read this book because of how much you hate it. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. I gave it a two star. It's not the worst thing in the world, but I'm unhappy. Anything above two stars is generous. And slightly delusional. But one question for the author. Why keep writing? Yeah, especially at 79. Compulsion? Peer pressure? Guilt? Pride? Because... All of that's not a good reason. Yeah. She deserved to retire. Frankly, she had a prolific writing career and she could have stopped. And stopped before she her work seemed to sort of start going downhill. Yeah. And unfortunately, what I've heard is that she wrote past when she should have. Which, like I said, I've heard that, but I'm like, okay, Agatha Christie, genius. How bad could it really be? That's pretty bad. I mean, isn't it the editor's job or the publisher's job to be like, hey, maybe stop writing? I just don't think they were going to stop milking that cash cow. That is true, which is very unfortunate for her. I wish she had some critical friends that are willing to be honest, but it does not seem to appear to be that way. My question is, is Ariadne Oliver a sort of self-insert? I honestly don't think Agatha Christie thought a lot of the character. <laughs> I don't think she likes her. The way she makes her act, 
act. Yeah, because at first when they're talking about like, oh, she's a famous author that writes murders, I was like, a self-insert. Could totally see, but I don't think she has much affection for her. No. She even destroyed her love of apples. That is true. She said, you know what? I'm taking that from you. No more apples. No more apples. It brought you such joy. I never have those again. I'm going to murder Perot in three books, but you get to lose your love of apples. Yes. I'm not excited anymore. <laughs> three more books after this. I'm sorry. This is the third to last book. If this is the tier we're at. I'm dubiously yikes. excited to see how it's done. We will see. Rating. I would give this a children's party out of 10 with the great Oscar from the office quote of it's like going to a children's party. And there's not really anything for you to do, but the child's having fun, so you just stay. That's how I felt with this book. Agatha was still having fun, so I guess I don't even know if fun is the word. She kept going, and as a reader, I'm just like, yay? I don't know. It was awkward, and I was just sitting there and wishing I was somewhere else. I finished it very quickly, because I just wanted it to be done. If we didn't do this, I would have just not finished the book. We done. Probably at the third rant about people. Yeah, DNR or DNF, sorry. Do not resuscitate this book. <laughs> Don't bring it back. No, why is there movies? DNR it, DNF it. Do not. All of it. No, just no. I gave it a bad apple out of 10. Because it is. It is. Legitimately rotten apple. You bite into yeah. it and you bite half a worm off. Soft and mushy and gross. Yeah. Brown. Yeah, it's just unpleasant all around. Just a bad experience. A bad experience. Sigh. Read again. No. Which is a first ever for an Agatha Christie book. And I'm worried it's not going to be the last. Oh, goodness. I own it. I go back and forth. A part of me is like, but I want to have a complete series. And the other part of me is like, it is wasting space on my shelf. It gets really good to the bottom of the shelf. I uh, I have other books I want. I'll decide what I do with my life. You just need to have the shelf of shame where like you want to have the complete set, but we don't talk about those books. <laughs> not even in order. It's just a shelf of shame. It's a shame. Would you read it again? No, I would not. That's six hours of my life I won't be getting back. I read it physically. So that's a week of my life. I'm not getting back. Oh, goodness gracious. I don't know what's worse. It was something. It was certainly a choice. So, favorite of the series so far. I'm curious, what's yours now? Yours moves around a lot. So, Poro investigates, which it, it was last time as well. I think that's the first time. It stayed. After Murder of Roger Ackroyd, it might change again. I know, because that's still sitting at my favorite. Yeah. Not because I totally called it from the beginning and made Lizzie sad, but <laughs> <laughs> go listen to that episode where I figure out who the murder is because I went galaxy brain. But, oh boy. That's my favorite, and I'm very excited for you to read it. So next time, we will be jumping past that book, and we'll be doing the big four. Yes. But have you read this book? Oh, sigh. Do you think Agatha Christie should have stopped writing? And if you do, at what point? That would be interesting. Do you have any book recommendations for us? Tell us all about it in the comments below. If you liked the video, hit like. And if you're enjoying yourself, hit subscribe for more. Thank you for exploring Halloween Party with us. Join us next time when we'll be covering Mirror Mirror by Jean Colonita. Hopefully that's right. Continuing our Disney Twisted Tales series. I'm Sam Reiner. And I'm Hannah Rossell. And we hope to see you and a friend here next time. Escape With Me Book Club is a Lunar Skull production. Check us out on TikTok or Instagram to keep up to date with us. Lunar underscore S-K-U-L-K.